I'm Gavin Costigan, Head of the Public Policy Team here at the University. Um, this is a two-part presentation on uh, responding to government consultations and parliamentary inquiries. The first half is about government consultations, that's, I say half, it's, that's the longer section, uh, and the, uh, the second part is uh, parliamentary inquiries. Uh, do stop me as we go along if you want to, there'll be a couple of places that I, I stop four questions, but uh, it's a very small group, so just, uh, just interrupt, um, otherwise I'll, I'll assume that everyone's asleep and that would be terrible. Um, I'm actually going to start uh, on government consultations uh, with asking two questions that sound remarkably stupid, um, and they're actually not remarkably stupid, uh, but play along and, and uh, suggest uh, an answer. So my first question is, why does government consult? Um, would anyone like to... Uh, uh, suggest why government consults. Yes. Do you know what this is? I'm, I'm jumping beyond the. I'm jumping into the critical bit already, but it might be useful because just in terms of work in criminal justice, and yep. I was talking to, about this someone the other day who was saying, you know, genuinely, why do they? Why do they consult when almost all the time they know what they want to do anyway? Yeah. It's basically public relations exercise. Yeah. Why do they do it? And anyway, so so one response to it is they do it because they've always done it and they feel like they should. Yeah. It's way to maintain relations. Yep, yep, that's is 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 is, is 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 certainly one of the reasons they do it. Yeah, anyone else want to jump in? Well, optimistically, because they have a good idea. Someone has a good idea that they can then they can then steal. they can then use that that use. that is true and also optimistic. Um, so I'll give you my list. Uh, <laughs> So first of all, and, just, and, and you guys know this anyway, um, but government doesn't consult when it doesn't know what to do. There are times when government doesn't know what to do, but that's not when it consults. Uh, so sometimes it knows what it wants to do, but it's exploring slightly different options. Um, it does consult then. More frequently, it consults when it's actually narrowed it down to, in some detail, what it wants to do, but actually wants to work through that detail with people. Um, and uh, quite commonly, actually, it's made its mind up, but it has to consult uh, under various... Uh, it, it's not just government relations. It's, it's actually in the rules and regulations that, it, that, that certain things need, need consultation, which doesn't mean that you can't point out something, um, but quite often, uh, when you're responding to consultations, um, if what you're trying to do is change their mind because... Um, the direction doesn't seem sensible, that's, that may not be something that's, that's possible. But we'll get into that, because my second stupid question, given that that's why they consult, um, is why would people respond? Uh, so, anyone want to play along? Why, why would we respond to consultations? We live in a democracy. We live in a democracy. Excellent, yes. Uh, venting is important, uh, agreed. It doesn't always change government policy, but it feels great. Um, well, to raise your profile as an individual organisation. Yeah. Like kind of yeah, raising the profile. So, do people ever respond because they're asked to respond? Yes, they do. Here's my list. Um, first reason to respond if you've got evidence, if you've got data, um, that's actually directly relevant to the questions, that's a very good reason to respond um, because you can contribute to that. Um, if you've got an expert opinion, um, sometimes experts are, are not in vogue, um, but an expert opinion, particularly if it's linked to data and evidence, is great. Um, a lot of people respond because of number three. I'm not really an expert, but I'm quite well informed and I care passionately about it. Um, this, is, this is the venting. Um, it feels good, it doesn't change government policy. Um, but if it makes you feel good, that's great. Um, uh, I thought it might be useful for REF. Um, just responding to government consultations will not help your REF performance. Um, if it's part of a wider strategy, and if that wider strategy actually leads to changes in regulations, closer collaboration with government or whatever, that can help your REF. But just putting in a response won't. Um, I'm, I'm spending the first few minutes putting you off, and then I'm going to tell you why you should be doing it. Um, Number five is interesting. I have a constituency. This is, this is the point that, that uh, Harry was making. Sometimes you as an individual or you as an organisation want to be seen as the kind of people who are responding to a consultation. Um, and actually, any of you who are involved in 
um, groups like a, a collection of deans or a research charity or whatever, um, you will have seen that they put together responses. You may have even helped to be involved in some of the responses to some of these things. And you'll know that, at least in part, that's written for the constituency um, as much as for the people. So it's a good reason to respond, but, but, but don't live in the assumption that all these things are going to change policy. Um, uh, and that's the kind of same as six. Seven is interesting. If you are ever asked to respond by government or ministers, please respond, because that means they know you, first hurdle. They actually like you and think you've got something to say, second hurdle. Um, so always, if, if you're asked to respond, that's great. Uh, and we can always help with that. Um, if you've got nothing better to do, that's, uh, you should get out more. But, uh, but again, uh, we, could, we can help with that. So think about why you're responding, because uh, if you're responding for the wrong reasons, it, it won't be great for you, and it won't necessarily add to the greatest sum of human knowledge. Um, so here's the question. Will my submission influence government policy? Most don't, but the best ones can. Um, if you are a very well-known person in your field, and this is a field that is being consulted upon, or if you are a well-known representative body, your stuff will always get read and always get read carefully for what you're trying to say. Um, if you're less well known, you, you actually do have to have something quite interesting and unique and, and good. But in general, and we'll talk about this a bit later, the response is usually more influential if it's part of a wider strategy. So coming out of nowhere, just putting in a response and running away again, um, may not achieve as much influence as warming people up, telling them about it, retweeting your response, talking about different things and so on. Um, but as we said, um, submitting may not be the only reason, influencing government policy, <coughs> sorry, may not be the only reason why you're submitting. So it kind of depends what, what we're trying to do. Um, so I need to introduce you to someone. I need to turn the telescope around and explain how this works from the civil service point of view. So imagine a department, there used to be one, called the Department of Trade and Industry. And let's find a, a young, enthusiastic civil servant. There he is. Um, he looks keen, doesn't he? He looks happy, he looks ready to do things. Now, I can tell you this young civil servant used to read government consultations quite a lot, uh, had the joy of working their way through them. Um, and uh, yeah, he's, he's less keen now, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> what does the poor civil servant actually do when you get consultations? Um, first one, different civil servants are responsible for different questions in a consultation document. So usually with consultations, they're split into specific questions um, and, and they're not done. So think about that when you respond. If you're always assuming that the person has read the answer to the previous question, they may not have done. Um, the junior civil servants read everything. Um, they have to, it's the rules. Um, and, um, but there may be hundreds of responses. There may not, but there may be hundreds of responses. They'll draw out themes, they'll draw out opinions, they'll draw out specific data. Um, and as it says there, when it's just opinion, it gets added to a body of opinion, but it doesn't change fundamentally what they're trying to do. And they assimilate this uh, data and they pull together a sort of a draft of what the responses are doing. Uh, and more senior civil servants won't read everything. They will read the key ones. They will read the ones that the junior civil servants tell them to read. Um, they'll read some of the individual data and they'll read the summary report of what's come out of that assessment. Um, and eventually it works its way up through the system and finally you get a response from the government which is signed off by ministers to say we've had a consultation, this is our response to the consultation. So every government consultation does have an official response to it. Um, but in many cases it says, you know what, we were right um, and we haven't changed our mind. Um, but that's, that's the process. So. Is he thinking that? Is he, is he, um, no, no. Um, what the poor civil servant's actually thinking is, I hope we don't get too many responses, uh, because uh, it's easier to have fewer responses. You've got less work to do, less reading to do, less pulling things uh, uh, together. So don't sit there thinking, as soon as this hits my desk, um, uh, sorry, as soon as it hits the desk, the civil servant's gonna be all over it and very, very excited about the fact that I've, I've gone to the effort of putting it together. It's, it's not like that uh, out, in, out in the department. Um, so, uh, should have said before the start, all of these slides will get sent to you afterwards. I'm, I'm looking at Giles, yes. So uh, you don't need to write all this down. But 
all government consultations are put together in the same place in a website and remarkably for government it's actually quite a good website. Um, it's easily searchable by department, by theme, by uh, lots of different things um, and that's the uh, 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 that's what it looks like. This, uh, this is a screenshot as of this morning. Um, so yes, you can search by keyword, uh, type of consultation, policy area, department and whatever. Um, and you can see the government is currently reviewing corporation tax computation charges for members of occupational pension schemes. Um, but 3,478. Um, some of those are open consultations, some of those are closed consultations where they're just telling you that the report is in um, so uh, and some of them are the report is in and we've, we've published our response so that's a consultation outcome so uh, again if you look down the list and you find one that looks really really interesting and then it says consultation outcome then you, you're too late um, you, uh, so the ones that are open are the ones that say they're open oops, say open consultation I didn't know it did that that's quite exciting um, so uh, there are different types of consultation, um, uh, depending upon whether it's a government department or agency, depending on what they're trying to achieve. Um, sometimes you have a really big consultation with a lot of questions. So um, I had the joy of reading the government's green paper on higher education, which led to the bill and led to the TEF and all those other uncontroversial things. Um, that had a large number of questions in it. I don't remember the exact number, but more than 40. Some of them are very, very short, very, very specific. This is what we're trying to do. Um, they can be highly technical. Um, they can be, you know, we are thinking of changing the route of this A road in this place from here to here, um, or they can be very, very generic. You know, we're struggling with the problem of teenage crime uh, and we're looking for, for policy solutions. So the, the whole range of different things. Um, so of course you match the response to the kind of, of consultation. Um, if it's a very, very technical thing, you don't want to open out a generic conversation because they're actually looking for a rather specific type of answer. Um, all of these were online this morning, so this is just to show you the kind of range of things. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I've used some jargon. These are all government departments. So DWP is the Department of Work and Pensions uh, on Occupational Pensions. The Ministry of Justice has a much more open consultation about transforming our justice system, um, which I'm sure uh, you're aware of. And it's actually been done in chunks. As a, uh, you know. um, so our new fantastic BASE, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, um, which is uh, a combination of the old biz with the old DEC, Department of Energy and Climate Change, joined together under Theresa May a few weeks ago. Um, that's consulting on a smart, flexible energy system. Um, DFE, a postgraduate doctoral loans, that's, that's a great read if anyone's a, uh, interested. And then you can see all sorts of things, basement developments in the planning system by local government, or the, what to do with the Levinson inquiry and should we implement it and beat up the press. Um, Department of Cultural, Media and Sport. Um, so those were just ones I found in five minutes this morning. All of those open, in case anyone's interested in responding, but uh, there are a lot of consultations. They come up every week. Um, in our team, we have a, a, a meeting on a Monday morning. We look at all the new consultations that have come up, uh, and if we think that there are people in the university that we know that we should send them to, we do, and some of you have had them <laughs> sent to you. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that we expect everyone to respond. But at least being aware of what the government's consulting on is really interesting and helpful, even if you don't want to put in a response. But if you do want to put in a response, then uh, keep listening, because that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so how to respond. Um, firstly, uh, read the exam paper. All consultations tell you how to respond. They all have a page specifically detailing the way to do it. Um, regular consultations have a six-week deadline. Some small ones that are urgent have a shorter deadline. Some really open ones that are either very big or ones where the government wants to kick it into the long grass forever have a consultation of three months. But the sort of standard time is six weeks. Um, and usually there's three options. Um, you either respond directly online to an online form, you download a form uh, and you fill it in and email it back, uh, or, you, or you download a form and you post it back, but don't do that. It just drives the civil servants nuts, because they can't cope with it. They've actually got to separate the individual questions and so on. Um, 
and, and don't do the last thing, which is just to ignore the questions and write what you like. Um, you can sometimes get away with a free text response if you're the Russell Group, but, but if you're not, it's, it's a bit harder. Um, so the online form is good when it's just you and there's relatively few questions and they're relatively short answers. Downloading the form and filling it in is usually better when several of you are going to work together or you've got longer answers. Um, but I have to say I've noticed recently uh, in the last two, three months that some government departments don't allow you to download a form anymore. Um, but it doesn't stop you going into the online form, copying the questions, circulating around then. Yeah. It's, a, it's a pain on our end. It makes it much easier on the civil service end. That's, that's why they've, they're trying to do it that way. Um, so the poor civil servant, why does he or she hate free text responses? Ignore it? Because it, they've got to specifically look at the answers to questions and report up what do, does the community think about these different questions. And when responses don't really cover the questions or not in a way that's easily followable, it's a real pain for them. Um, and what that often means is that um, uh, if it doesn't answer the question, um, quite often they say, well, okay, uh, it's not adding anything to my summary of this question. I, I don't need to worry about it. Um, and it's also true, of course, that um, if they're only reading individual questions and the response isn't specific about which bits are for which questions, the right person may not read the right bit at all. Um, uh, however, if you're in representative bodies, love free text responses. So the Council of Deans, the Russell Group, the uh, Arthritis UK, whatever. Uh, why? Because it's easier to put an argument together on that basis. Um, and it reads better as a, as a whole document. You, you put your, your argument together in, in that way. Um, but it's written as much for the people who are members as for the government. Um, sadly, if you are the guild of widget makers, um, you're going to get read uh, because of who you are. Um, even though the civil servants don't like it because it's, it, it, it's, it's not in that. Be so if you're the Russell Group, you will get your response read because you're the Russell Group. Um, but if you're an individual, uh, you kind of need to play the game. So it depends. Some of you will be in, in, in different positions. Um, the other thing is, um, and I've got to be slightly careful uh, say, saying this, some of my colleagues across academia forget that uh, the government and the civil service are actually trying to do real things with real people and achieve real things. Um, so they will ask, can this thing be done in terms of money and time and people and acceptability, and would it work? Um, so um, if it's too expensive, it's too slow, it's only theoretical, or it will screw up something else, it's not achieving their aims, however interesting uh, and however fascinating it is. Um, I'm sure you know all of that. Uh, but. Now, I'm going to pause there. We're going to go into good bits and bad bits and of, of what an actual response looks like. But that's me rattling through the, the, the introduction. Any questions or comments? Should I? Yeah, what would, no. so, that, I'm not articulating. No, no, no. That's fine. There is this confusion between me as an individual yeah. and me representing the university. So, and how careful do I need to be in terms of separating one <coughs> from the other one to respond? Um, for both government consultations and parliamentary inquiries, um, one of the first questions is, are you responding as an individual or are you responding representing an institution? Um, if you say you're responding representing an institution, then my advice would be you better have the institutions backing for what you're going to say. Um, but if not, then, you're then it's actually down to what does this university's uh, position on academic freedom and expression, which is actually the same as everyone else's, go out there, express your opinion, that's fine. There are examples of consultations where the university has put in a, a submission and individual members of staff have put in a submission. And that's great. That's uh, un 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 unsurprising, um, particularly for the things that are affecting higher education policy, because as an institution, we feel that we have a, a collective idea, but as individuals, clearly people also have a, a, a pretty specific idea of what the implications are and what should be done. So uh, as long as you don't say you're, you're doing it on behalf of the institution, and it's a, it's a direct question right at the beginning. So. Yeah. 
correspondence. It would have to be listed at Southampton, even though yeah. just, we're not representing the University yeah. of Southampton. So, so it's a shorthand, I guess. I, I think it's fine. Um, we thought uh, we'd been clear. Uh, what you could. <laughs> What you can do, uh, it, it, well, it, it depends. If it's an online form, it's a bit difficult. If it's if it's more, uh, if there's a little bit more space, you can sometimes even hard write in your disclaimer. Um, you can write so, so we'll yeah, yeah. yeah. Centre, yeah. 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 So, but, 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 you know, he, at some stage, somebody who's in a representative role makes a decision. So when the university has responded to a higher education policy issue, um, in theory, all 6,000 members of staff and 23,000 students might have an opinion, but they're not all asked. So, um, and it comes as a shock, but the university still manages to pull together a response and put something in on behalf of the university. It needs somebody sufficient with sufficient... Um, sign off authority to say, actually, I represent the university on this issue, and and that's that's fine. So, uh, so you're right. I don't think the university is ever going to worry um, uh, a, a about expressing opinions in, in consultations. Um, I've never seen it. Never seen it. Okay. Shall we move on to the next bit? So the next bit is uh, sort of do's and don'ts, goods and bads. Uh, what to do actually in the consultations. Um, so be brief, be to the point, don't waffle, um, because actually it's got a lot of these things to read, the civil servants. So, so get to the point. Um, no big conversations about methodology, by the way. Uh, um, it's data, it's your evidence. That's what they don't have that is most beneficial. But do say what the evidence means and do say how it relates to the question. Because sometimes um, I've seen responses that say, all the answers are in my paper. And we said, no, no, don't attach a paper. So they say, OK, all the answers are here. And, and it's not quite so clear as to how they're answering the question. Um, however, uh, it's th it, this is where we can add the most value, provided it's wrapped in enough information for the non-expert to see how the data and the evidence is useful. Right, yeah. So I was too flippant. Uh, let me restate, you're right. There are times when that is exactly what you need to do. But even in those times, um, reverse the scientific article paper. Start with the answer. Uh, then explain why it's the answer. And then come in with the kind of the, if it's important to show the rigor, the methodology, and, 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 and so on. But don't start with that. Because uh, they won't get down to the answer. Okay. So, um, so it's writing for a particular audience. It's writing for a particular audience. Yeah. Um, it's uh, and and in many cases, of course, uh, what's scientifically or, or uh, uh, interesting from a research point of view is the uncertainty in the data. That's not necessarily what's interesting from a policy point of view. The policymaker is thinking what should I do, or I'm thinking of doing this, is that the right thing to do? Uh, and they need help to know whether the data is telling them yes broadly or no broadly, or 
or something else. Um, so we need to use the response to actually help them answer the question they're trying to answer. But for example, um, assuming the government's trying to do X, whatever X is, here are some, some kinds of things that would help them. This is what happened when other people did it. Um, it's similar to this, and this is what we know about this. This is the number of people who are concerned about it. It would affect this. One of the underlying assumptions behind this actually may not be as robust as you think because that's the kind of thing where you're saying, this is what you want to do. So start with what they want to do and then show how your data tells them something about what they want to do. OK, so the third question is answer the question, will it work? I mean, we've, it, same message as before. It's all about doability because um, they're making policy. They're deciding what to do. Um, so, uh, and if you're saying what they're going to do won't work um, and you're proposing some other alternative, will your alternative work and will it work better than what they're proposing? Um, if you're not proposing an alternative and simply saying it won't work, that's okay, but, but be quite understanding that they're, they're, they're actually trying to work out what to do. Um, so if, if everything is no, 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 and if it's, only, if it's going to work 75%, Actually, that's pretty good, uh, you know. Uh, so the fourth thing, so this is a really boring nuts and bolts thing, but I've made this mistake before. When you have a consultation, uh, you have a document, and you read the document, and interspersed with the document are questions. When you go to answer the questions on the form, you'll just have the questions. Sometimes it's tempting to read the questions only and think that you understand them based on what they actually in the question. And actually, when you read them in the context with the document, they mean something entirely different, or there's a lot of background there. Um, so I've got burnt myself. I just So always have the two documents together. Uh, if you're answering online, um, have the, the consultation and see what they're, what's behind the question, what they're actually trying to get you. And what have they already told you? Because you, when I did it wrong, I answered a question, and, and actually my point had already been made by them in their consultation, so I felt a bit stupid. Um, uh, and the last thing is, if you are referring back to their consultation, use paragraph numbers, tell them which page it's on, be as helpful as you can, so that the poor civil servant doesn't have to do any more additional work than they already have to do. So make it as user-friendly as, as possible for, for the person reading it. Um, things not to do, now we talked about ranting. Um, even if you're really good at ranting, <laughs> don't, well, okay, I, if it makes you feel good, that's great. But, as, as <laughs> but the, point, the, the point is, generally speaking, there are pluses and minuses to, to policy options, and generally speaking, the people in the civil service already know what they are. Um, so just ranting doesn't, doesn't help them decide what to do. That's, that, that's, the, that's the point. Um, don't attach a copy of your receipts page, but they will never read it. I mean, never read it. Um, so there's, if you've got 100 responses, you're not going to download research papers for, uh, attached to responses. You just haven't got time. Um, so get the, the information you need in, in, uh, in the response itself. Um, and this is what we were talking about before. Answer the bits that you've got something to contribute to and leave the rest blank. Um, it's always tempting to, to feel you have to have an answer. but particularly if the thing you really got a contribution to is question 13 or 14 or 15, if you've written a whole lot of rubbish earlier on, uh, that's not going to you know, be that helpful. So just answer the bits, leave the rest blank. Most people do that. Um, there's a consultation at the moment about uh, schools for everyone. Part of it is about grammar schools. Part of it is about uh, encouraging universities to uh, uh, sponsor schools. Part of it's about something else. Um, We've only answered the bit about universities sponsoring schools. We haven't gone into the other, the other, the other bits and pieces. So is blank better than just something like nothing to say or no comments? Or Depends. Indication that you at least thought about the question, but didn't decide um, not I think if you're uh, if you're writing it as an, uh, a form that you're emailing it, you can say no comments to make. I think in an online form, it's better to leave it blank because if you leave it blank, it won't get cut and pasted into somebody. Whereas somebody gets a cut and paste thing that just says, I don't have any comments. It's better just to leave it as is. Um, 
Now, government have started doing this in the last year or so. They have a yes, no, not sure question. Um, should we be doing this particular thing? Should we be thinking of this particular thing? Um, it's incredibly disingenuous because the answer is always, it depends. Um, however, what's going to happen is the civil servants are going to say 55% of people said yes, 38% of people said no. So regardless of the, the real answer, which is, well, it could be this or it could be that, it, it depends what else is going to happen. Think about how you want your vote counted. Okay, this is tactical voting rather than answering the question. Um, we put in a lot of not sure, whereas actually we are sure, we know very well what we think, uh, and it's maybe, um, but you haven't given us maybe. Um, but sometimes it's better to be counted as yes or better be counted as no. So just beware that it's not very um, evidence friendly, this question, uh, but it, 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 there are a lot of them about. Um, so that I talked a little bit about the wider strategy, because just putting in a response and walking away may not be the right thing to do, may not be the thing that really adds, adds value. So um, here are some things. Um, alert people that you're going to respond, that you've seen the response, that you're thinking of putting in a response. When you have responded, send them a copy, even if they're not the people dealing with it. Um, find ways to incorporate the arguments you're making in other regular contacts that you're having. Use the fact that you've bothered to answer a consultation as a plus point in, in any interactions that you're having. If you speak to us, we can do it from the other way around. We can uh, find a bit on a, a place on our website to upload your response and then link people to it and then tweet and uh, uh, various social media. Um, we have a number of people who follow our Twitter handle. It's 1,500. 1600, sorry, I'm behind the time, 1600. So not all of them will, will immediately jump to it, but some will. Um, and so we have ways to, to keep adding value to the work that, that you're trying to do. Um, but engagement is a long-term business, and, and just dipping a toe in and then running away has about as much impact as you'd expect. So try and see it as a long-term thing. But talk to us. We're really happy to talk to people about a longer-term engagement. That's kind of the end of, of the session on government consultations. Um, so rather than do this as an exercise, um, th the point of this is simply to, uh, to show very generally uh, the kind of things. This is, this is the quote from the Department of Crazy Ideas. This is their quote from the, the document, which I've carefully put back to the question for you so you can see why. Um, they're, they're proposing to ban cycles from Southampton Common. Firstly, they've got this yes, no, and not sure question. Um, so you'd think if you're going to respond to this, you're actually going to have to get your vote counted, however you want it. Uh, and, then, and then it just says comments. And that's where you'd, of course, put your evidence. The only point for putting up something silly like this, and I realize it, although I had a long conversation with somebody who actually was in favor of this in my last time I did this course. But the, the point is, what government are interested in is Cycles and Southampton Common. We might have all sorts of different types of evidence. We might have traffic evidence. We might have evidence of the health benefits of cycling. We might actually have data about collisions of cyclists on the road compared with, you know. So we could have lots of different types of evidence which we'd have to bring to the, to the question. They're only interested in what the evidence tells them about that. So we've got to think around what they're doing and put the evidence in, in there rather than thinking about our evidence, which is about geography, or it's about uh, health, or it's about, about something else. So that was the, that was the only point of that. Um, I, I hope they don't ban cyclists across Southampton Common, because my commute's stuffed if they do. Um, I don't, don't think so. Um, OK, so the second part, and it is shorter, um, is about parliamentary inquiries. So as well as government releasing consultations, Parliament actually also does a number of inquiries. Um, they're also advertised. Uh, again, you'll get the slides. Um, but this is, uh, there is a, uh, another website. The website looks like this. Um, it's not quite as searchable as the government inquiry one. Um, so it takes a little bit longer to find uh, exactly what inquiries are there, because it's a long list and it doesn't qu you can't quite search. Um, we do the same thing as we do for government consultations. So we look at the list of parliamentary inquiries every week. And if we think one's in your area, 
if there's a inquiry about pure maths, we know where to send it. So we'll, 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 we'll send it on. Um, but we do actually uh, send a number of inquiries on. Um, uh, now. I mean, actually, weird things do happen. There is actually still a bill trapped in the Indiana legislature where they were trying to legislate the value of pi to be true. OK. Which it is not. No, no, no. It got through one house, and then it got jammed in committee in the other one yeah, because someone right. said, if we did this, we'll be the laughing stock of the world. Yeah. And it's been there like 100 years. OK. OK. So, so you know, it might not. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. That's good. So, so I apologize if I'm teaching people stuff that they know, but not everyone knows the structure of the UK Parliament and, and, and how the committees work. So apologies if you know all of this stuff. Um, you've heard of the House of Commons, the House of Lords. Um, they both have select committees. These are committees made up of either MPs or Lords looking at particular issues. Um, and those are the ones that hold inquiries. Um, in the House of Commons, they have one for every department. So there's now, uh, there's, there's one for environment, food and rural affairs. There's one for communities and local government, you know, matching the department. And then there's a few special ones. Um, the most interesting one for universities is the Science and Technology Committee, but there are a few weird ones that we don't worry about. Um, there are three joint committees between Lords and Commons. Human rights and national security often can come up with certain people in the university. Statutory instruments, if people are very, very obscure area. Um, um, so that is actually to do with the operation of the Houses of Parliament. So if your research area is in UK parliamentary democracy and procedures, this is going to be your cup of tea. Otherwise, probably not. Um, so the House of Lords has some rather strange things, but it also has a Science and Technology Committee who are quite strong and do, do some, some work. Um, and they, do, they work in a number of different ways. They have regular sessions where they just haul ministers in, beat them up, try and hold them to account. But they, they also launch some more formal inquiries, and that's what we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it's worth saying that they've also been doing some recent experiments. So one of the experiments is, is evidence check, where instead of having an inquiry, they say, this is what the government says their evidence is. What do you think of that? Uh, and another one is, instead of writing on a big, uh, long inquiry, they say, give us a two-minute video that tells us what research you're doing in this area that's going to contribute to something. So there's some experience. But they're small. The main thing is kind of parliamentary inquiries. Um, so we just told you about government consultations. The difference between the two probably is easier to pick out. Uh, the first one is, so government consultations are testing specific ideas. Parliamentary inquiries are actually looking more widely in general. They're asking, um, what's the government doing? Is it doing the right things? Um, so whereas in a government consultation, they're saying, we want to do X, is this right? Um, and the answer is, well, it kind of depends. It, it depends on a whole range of things. In, in a parliamentary inquiry, there's a much greater opportunity to sort of set the context and to, to see the whole, and that's actually what parliament are trying to do. They're trying to see, in general, is the government going in the, in the right direction? Um, the second thing is that because of that, parliamentary inquiries have far fewer questions, and they're much more open uh, and they actually almost invite what I'd call a free text response, where you, you kind of answer them. And, and it's much easier then to bring in the kind of evidence. Um, and as I said, they're exploring the whole area around a policy often. Um, so here's an example. This is a current parliamentary, I beg your pardon. This is a parliamentary inquiry that's closed. So, sorry, shouldn't get anyone excited. This closed a, a, a few weeks ago. Um, so, but the entire inquiry has uh, five questions. It's about food waste. And you can see, you know, the, the first question is a pretty open, just as, as it is. Um, you know, what's, what's the overall picture? What measures would be most effective? Um, and then it gets down to, and how effective are the existing things that the government's got in place? So that's quite a typical uh, kind of parliamentary inquiry very different in feel to a government consultation. Um, but it, it's in many ways easier for an academic community to, to, to get into uh, and answer these types of things. Um, sometimes uh, Parliament look at a, a government's policy document and say, you know what, we're simply going to ask people what they think about that. Um, 
And uh, so there was an uh, inquiry in January 2016 where they said, the government's published this policy document. What do you think? Um, and that was it. That was one question. Just, just tell, us, tell us what you think about that. Um, which is usually code for either we think it's a bit rubbish or um, it's so important. This is a major, major thing. We really, you know, the government's put this out, but we really want to, to get a wider look on it. So, you know, one of those. Um, so what does this mean? It means data and evidence are still the most useful thing you've got. It still means don't waffle and be brief. Um, but free text is okay, and, uh, but make it easy to read, you know, sh short paragraphs, paragraph numbers. Um, but there's more opportunity to explain what the government should be doing rather than only answering what it specifically asks you to answer about. Um, the other thing about select committees, you've uh, probably seen on the telly um, every so often on the news, um, select committee hearings where people give oral evidence. Um, usually the ones that appear on the TV is when they've hauled in someone who doesn't want to be there and they're giving them a hard time uh, and it's the kind of thing that would make a good drama on, on television. Most of the time it's not like that and whenever academic experts are asked to come in and give evidence it's absolutely not like that. The committee are simply trying to um, explore more what your evidence is really saying about the overall problem. Um, if you get called to give evidence, this is actually quite uh, good because it's more likely that the evidence that you're presenting is going to make it into the final report, is going to have some influence in what uh, it's saying. Um, and uh, one of my jobs is to try and, when we have something quite good, uh, is, to, is, is to try and see if we can get people to call oral evidence. Of course, not that many people get called and you would expect the committee will always pull in the minister and the, the people and will always pull in the main representative bodies. So um, academic experts get called in often when their evidence is very specific and quite telling and not the same as everybody else's. Um, as an example, um, the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee has an inquiry about autonomous vehicles at the moment. The university's put in four responses it, from quite different parts of the university. Um, but one of them is about um, the, uh, the human responses if you sort of don't drive your car for a while and then you suddenly have to drive it again. Um, and we have expertise and evidence that's quite different to everyone else's. Uh, now, I haven't heard yet, but if the committee really wanted to explore, is it reasonable to have a driverless car system where uh, you still have to have a driver there who has to sort of pay attention and then, you know, actually, we've got the expertise here in the university. We've put in a submission. I would expect them to call us to, not me, <laughs> call Neville Stanton, uh, to come and, and, and explain that um, because it's actually quite pertinent to what they're doing. And it's not like the general stuff that other people would have put in. So, We'll have to see, um, but it is, can be quite good, uh, and we do our best to help people get there. Um, as usual, if you have a wider engagement strategy, if you're already talking both to government and to parliament and to other people about things, um, and you publicise your uh, submissions and you allow us to publicise and tweet about your submissions, again, they have a, a greater impact. It's all the same, same things. Um, the committees have, each have a clerk, um, who's responsible for the business. They often have something called a specialist who will immediately tell you that they're not a specialist, um, but that's the, 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 the role, the function, the name of their function. But in effect, they are the person who reads all the submissions, who tries to pull out what the evidence is saying, what the data is saying. Um, but there's also something called POST, the Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology, uh, and they uh, know a lot about what's going on. They take a lot of evidence. They're good people to work with. Um, but come and talk to us, uh, and, and we can sort of go through these things in, in a bit more detail. Um, now, I talked about some of the uh, recent experiments. Uh, so the uh, House of Commons Select Committee on Science and Technology um, asked the government to produce their evidence and then asked people to critique it, rather than asking for a whole lot of evidence where... 55 people put in the same, basically the same submission. Um, I'm not sure it, it was a massive success, and I haven't seen them do it again, but it was interesting. They're trying to create things in different ways. Uh, and I say, the Energy and Climate Change Committee, when we had one, 
because we've just scrapped the Department of Energy and Climate Change, um, asked people to put up 30 second videos on innovations to transform the energy sector. And again, the, the, the reason for that was to get more people to do it, to get, they actually wanted, they thought getting people to do a 30 second video that says, I'm working on this piece of energy or this battery technology or this, and, and it will have this big effect, would be more people would get involved and that would add, add to their things. Again, I haven't seen anyone else do it, so we'll have to see. Um, so that's the end, really. I mean, it's, uh, uh, some things are all the same. Some things are slightly different style. Um, but, but any questions on the parliamentary inquiries?